the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, mysterious air fight, tactics and strategy, cast jets with rockets, and metal beasts, desert racing chieftain. The day when new 2023 vehicles come to Metal Beasts is very close, but there's still some time left. Let's waste none of it and introduce the first, and so far the only, Jordanian tank in the game, found in the premium segment of the British tech tree. Please welcome a modernized chieftain under the name of Khalid. Its main caliber is a two-plane stabilized 120mm gun with elevation angles between minus 10 and plus 20 degrees. It's also equipped with two coaxial machine guns and 12 smoke grenade launchers. The engine and transmission compartment is in the rear. The crew seating scheme is classic, one in the hull and three in the turret. The main difference between the Khalid and its British predecessor is engine power. 1,200 horsepower is almost twice as much as the Chieftain has. Naturally, this buff was extremely welcome for one of the slowest MBTs. The Jordanian tank still takes no awards in speed, of course, but now it can move ahead of the main advance and take key positions earlier. Another good change is its reverse speed of 37 kilometers an hour. Coupled with a dozen smoke grenades, your retreat from a situation getting too hot might actually be quick and discreet. Nevertheless, a good engine and new capabilities brought with it uncovered some new vulnerabilities. The sluggish chieftain tanks usually encounter enemy fire at quite a distance and at favorable positions that hide their lower hull areas. Their armor can sustain incoming fire quite well in such circumstances. The Khalid, however, needs to keep moving. And that means getting up close and personal with the enemy, which exposes vulnerabilities. The lower glacis is extra fragile. Even capped rounds of the World War II era can easily penetrate it, to a deplorable result. If you want to survive in this machine, try your best at hiding its hull behind cover. The Khalid itself is armed with thinned armor-piercing rounds that can pen any vulnerable area and even some well-protected ones. Another type you might want to take with you to battle is Hesh. It's handy against light vehicles and those opponents who only dare stick out a piece of their turret. Remember to use your laser rangefinder to avoid misses. The Jordanian MBT turned out to be a truly versatile machine. It's far from perfect, of course. The hull could use some strength, some thermals would be quite handy but it's still good enough to stay efficient in any combat situation. The history of aviation remembers a lot of air battles where the underdog suddenly came out victorious. The reasons for most of such cases are easy to find and analyze. But some stories are tough nuts to crack. You check multiple scattered sources to find any useful information, make propositions, and build your versions, only to remain with a handful of still unsolved mysteries. This is exactly the kind of story we'd like to tell you today. It happened on July 22, 1942. An incomplete squadron of eight I-16 fighters, commanded by Ivan Pilipenka, flew out to cover the Soviet army retreat across the Don River. The Luftwaffe strove to destroy any and all ferries, which meant that they needed to clear the skies before the Junkers could deliver their loads. And that's where history gets a bit muddy. Some say the Germans threw 14 Messerschmitt 109s at Pilipenka's 8 I-16s. Others claim it was 14 110s and 8 109s. And we need to note here that this battle had quite a lot of eyes on the ground. Could it have been two different battles? Unfortunately, there's no way to establish the truth in this case. One thing was indisputable, however. The slow donkeys, as they were called in the Soviet Union, had no chance against the brand new German fighters. All the attackers had to do was perform their famous maneuver, attack in a dive at high speed and return to altitude immediately. 
What could the I-16 do with that? Just last until the first mistake, maybe. But that day was the opposite day. In their first attack, the Germans lost two fighters, with one downed by Captain Pilipenka himself. He clearly set an example for his subordinates. And what was that example, exactly? Well, witnesses reported the I-16 fighters flying weird that day. It felt like they had no system at all, no formation, even. The Germans were infuriated by the losses. Their task was to knock down those fighters at any cost, so they attacked again, and again were met with a nightmare. Another fighter was set on fire and knocked to the ground, and then the fourth one took a dive into the Don River. The third attack only brought more losses. Having lost a few more of their own, the Messerschmitt fighters made a chaotic turn and headed west with a drop in altitude. The Junkers never made it to the battlefield that day, of course. The Soviet fighters reported a total loss of zero planes. The mystery doesn't end there, however. Some sources state that Pilipinka and his flying mates scored two 110s and four 109s that day. Others mention six 110s and no 109s whatsoever, and we still have no clue how they managed to pull this off in the first place. Some better informed people suggest that Captain Pilipenko might have become the first ever person to use a maneuver sometimes called the millstones, or defensive circles, confusing the attacking Germans. Four fighters assumed the classic defensive circle position, flying clockwise, with four others flying counterclockwise. Pilipenka himself and three of his most experienced pilots took on the harder circle, going against the propeller rotation direction. No matter where the Germans tried to attack this formation, they were always met up front with two cannons and the machine guns of the I-16s. The result was… predictable. Was this whole story actually true? We can only guess. In our previous episodes, we told you how to better use strike aircraft of various generations, and here's the jet era in its full strength. Today we'd like to focus on aircraft armed with conventional bombs and rockets, while more advanced guided munitions will receive their own segment in one of our future episodes. The top tier of this class will be represented by late modifications of the F-4 Phantom II. The medium tier would have one of the most famous contemporary strike aircraft, the Su-25, but we'd like to begin with the early jets today. It actually took quite a lot of time to choose a machine that could be a good demonstration of early jet cast tactics. You see, armies and engineers were busy developing completely new engines and thus had little time for strike aircraft. Meanwhile, fighters rarely carried bombs, and if they did, the loads were limited. We still needed something to use, so we picked one of the most widespread planes of the time, the American F-84 Thunderjet. So, the major feature of this early period is a limited bomb load. This one can only carry two 1,000-pound bombs with no ballistic computer. The aircraft can show quite a bit of speed, so you need to practice before you can reliably hit a target. The F-84 also has World War II-era rockets, but those surely failed the test of time. You don't see a lot of open compartment vehicles at this tier, and damaging any other type needs a direct hit. A tricky task indeed. As for the tactics, well, it's an early jet, so the universal advice is to keep your speed up. Keep your altitude at around 2 kilometers, pick a target, attack it in a dive, and retreat close to the ground right after. Once you're out of ordnance, you have two options. Either go back to base for two more bombs, or continue as a fighter. Most early strike jets were meant to do exactly this, by the way. Later machines, such as the Su-25, can do much more damage. It even has guided missiles, but still, bombs and rockets are this aircraft's bread and butter. The Su can boast a decent thrust-to-weight ratio, a ballistic computer, and numerous hardpoints. There are so many, in fact, that a single Su-25 can shred the entire enemy team without having to reload if the enemy doesn't resist, of course. The main danger for this aircraft is SAMs with IR-guided missiles, so remember to use your flares when you attack. 
It also makes sense to keep as low as possible to prevent enemy air defenses from spotting you too early. Use the landscape, hide behind hills and trees, and sneak up on them. Pop up, use your cannon and rockets here since they're better than bombs for this tactic, and then leave the way you came, quickly and stealthily. When the enemy has no air defense left, you can go back to the traditional slower strikes, done from a couple kilometers above. Much like early strike aircraft, just more accurate thanks to the ballistic computer. Now, air combat is where specialized strike jets have poor efficiency. The air-to-air -air missiles do give them a chance, but an experienced fighter will have no trouble knocking down a heavily laden target. On to top-tier unguided cast. Ugh, this one's tricky. On the one hand, it's mostly employed by multi-role fighters that can carry tons of bombs and rockets, but can also drop them all in seconds and become dangerous zippers. It would have been amazing, but for top SAMs with ranges exceeding 10 kilometers. The only way you can counteract those is with ultra-low approaches, like the one we described for the Su-25. But pulling those off at supersonic speeds is orders of magnitude harder. You'll need to have an excellent knowledge of the map, presence of mind, some lightning-quick reflexes, and a whole lot of luck. We have to admit that fighting against modern anti-air defenses requires guided munitions, but that's a story for another episode. And while our strike aircraft restock, we'll answer some of your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Roomba. What plane has the most turrets? Hello, Roomba. The plane with the most turrets is the Japanese H-8K flying boat, with a total of 10. We'd also like to mention the German BV-238 here. It has a total of 18 guns. SWAT-012 asks, With the F-105 being a bomber, why doesn't it get an air spawn? Hey, SWAT-012, starting with rank 6, all strike aircraft spawn on the airfield because their flight performance is mostly on par with fighters. If we give them a chance to get to ground vehicles faster, that would make air combat less balanced. Another question comes from Solos. I just got 357 unlocked vehicles out of 2,371. I counted them one by one, so maybe more or less. Hi, Solos. You don't really need to count them manually. If you click on your name on the hangar screen, you can see how many machines for each nation you have. Thunder Hans writes, What's the difference between the PTLO2 and WMA, and what's the best way to play them? Hey, Thunder Hans. The main difference between these two tanks is armament and ammo choice, but it doesn't affect their usage much. Much like other wheeled vehicles, their main task is flanking. We told you more about the WMA in episode number 264. Check it out when you have time. And the last comment for today was written by Toxic the Wolf. I would love to see all the P-51 Mustangs and P-47 Thunderbolts get drop tanks. Sure might not be useful, but would definitely be more realistic. Hello there, Toxic. Modeling drop tanks for each plane takes quite a lot of time, so we prioritize machines that enjoy the most benefit from them. But eventually, we'll get to World War II prop fighters, too. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to paint your Challenger red for that extra speed. Leave a like share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.